Here we are. You start. You, you kick off. I was actually still in drama school, and that was my first audition, uh, and I I hated it right away. I thought it was annoying to make an audition. <laughs> uh, but he was looking, and Nicholas was looking for actors. That was not actors. That was actually, he hated actors, to be honest. And then, uh, but he needed a few, everybody told him. And then somebody told him about me over there in the school somewhere far away. And I, had, I was speaking so fast that nobody understood what I said. And he loved the idea, and then we did the casting. And then, true enough, you had no idea what I said in the casting. And um, so that's how we met in this very building. Yeah, this is where, uh, right from around the studio across, was the first offices where we did the first pusher. And um, I was 24 at that time, and I didn't know how to make a film. And um, I had been kicked out of acting school in New York. And I, at a certain age, around 24, I was very anti anything that was establishment. So, of course, anything that was considered uh, trained actors was like the Antichrist. So the idea was to make a film with as much reality as possible. But um, I think that... You know, you're very naive when you're young and you think you can do the whole, you can answer all the difficult questions yourself. But during the casting, um, there was a woman that was doing it. The film had heard of Mats Mikkelsen and he was making a lot of waves in the acting school here in Copenhagen. And um, he went in for an audition. You had long hair, I remember. It was all yeah. black. Yeah. And I think you had oh, done your first uh, short movie. You'd done, a, uh, you'd done a, like a short film. Yeah, I did. Just um, before. So I think you came from that audition. No, or, or that shoot, because you looked like that guy from that, movie, yeah, that short right. film. Anyway, so, um, uh, I mean, of course, what's to say? He was amazing. So, um, you know, right away, I, he was offered the role, and Matt's happily accepted, and... Then we went from then on. I never had a, a dream as a child of being an actor. I was a dancer for, for quite some years before, and I never, never had a dream of being a dancer. Everything was just kind of coincidentally. But, I mean, looking back, I, I loved films. Uh, I, I was in love with it, but I never saw myself as an actor in it. I think I just, like anybody else, identified with the characters. I was not... I was not... Um, thing about having a career like that, I, I just became Bruce Lee, you know, that, that, that was my whole childhood, you know, you, you thought you were Bruce Lee, but to, to make it into a job, never, never ever thought of it, it just happened late. But once I started going to drama school, I very fast realized that it was films I wanted to do. Uh, theater was fine in many ways, also for me, but I was much more in love with the media of film. I would see the casting tapes and, you know, of course, Matt's was amazing. And I had actually hired another actor to play the, uh, the kind of the lead of the film because this was the secondary character that Matt's was auditioning for. And you actually even knew that actor. Mm, very well, um, so, yeah. I, I did theater with him. Maybe. Yeah, a guy called Anas Newport. And um, so Matt's was hired and we started to rehearse because I thought you had to rehearse in order to make films and it was quite <laughs> painful probably and we even had a table reading yeah. all of us where we read through the script and I actually just found the tape of that table reading <laughs> in my basement I have all that evidence oh, cool. but um, so it turned out that the guy that I had hired to play the lead was not good so I fired him two weeks before we were supposed to start shooting, and I didn't really have an alternative, but he was just wrong. 
I remember I told you about it. Yeah, and I you think were you like, said the word wrong more than not good. <laughs> okay, he and was the, pretty bad. Yeah, the, he was bad. The, the thing was that there was only a few actors, and the rest were people from the real environment. So you had to really catch that train. If you didn't catch it to a certain degree, it didn't look right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was the issue. It was a little too trained for you. Yeah, he was too trained, and up until then, it's changed a little bit, but up until then, you know, the conventional acting archetype from Denmark were very classical trained, very theatrical, and didn't talk like real people. And that was what was needed. People need to talk like real people. So I wanted to inhabit the whole movie with real people as much as I could, but of course you need actors to understand certain avenues to go down. You know, I'd seen the Battle of Algiers, I've seen all those films, and the killing of a Chinese book, all those things that inspired me when I was like young and I was like I wanted to capture whatever that was and bring it here to Copenhagen. So um, <laughs> so he's fired, this, um, this very trained actor, it was a painful experience of course and then I hired uh, Kim Botnia who at that time was you also knew and had just gotten out of acting school, had been in a movie called The Night Watch, which had been very successful. And it kind of started a new trend of a new, new generation of, of using actors. So uh, he came in and we often did the film. And you can kind of say that changed everything in Danish modern cinema in terms of how people act in film. And everyone nowadays just imitates Matt Mikkelsen. So you kind of you, you and Kim, and Kim, and but Slacko. I and very Slacko, But I think that you really you you set the barrier of what was going to you know evolve in Danish acting tradition. It, it was definitely something that that we as a generation were craving in this business because at that time they had already twenty years before done Mean Streets and Taxi Driver, and we had done nothing remotely like it. So I think it was also our little revolution of like, it has to be done here, we have to do our own, we have to move on from here, right? Uh, so I think it was not only the actors, it was the whole style, the energy of the whole project mm -hmm. that was giving a new tone to the, to the Danish cinema. I had dropped out of film school to, because um, I was able to get, I was, I guess, conning the government into giving me money. And they gave us around 4 million crowns, which is about 400,000 euros or something, a little bit more. And then with a, some investment from a distributor, we were able to get it to that 5 million that crowns that the film ended up costing, which, you know, roughly is about 700,000 euros. Um, well, a lot of people in the industry felt it was very arrogant of me to drop out of film school and make a film instead. Um, there was not a lot of support. We couldn't hire a crew because all the people that I wanted to hire or were meeting with would not work on a first-time filmmaker's film, especially when they hadn't gone to film school. So the cameraman, Morten Sipor, this was his first film. The sound people, we couldn't get any sound people, so we had to go to Sweden to get sound people, which is That's ironic right. because nobody understood what, <laughs> what Irina was saying in the film. Uh, all the other actors were, besides Mats and Kim and Laura Drasbeck, who, was, who played the girl in the film, were basically real gangsters that I had met in various ways that would come and play themselves. And then um, the production designer, was someone that I knew when I was little, had never really done anything. So it was a lot of, nobody knew a lot about filmmaking. So they had a kind of a, an energy to go into it. And so off we went and we shot the film in chronologically order because I had read somewhere that John Cassavetes had done his films in chronologically order. I thought, well, let's do that, you know, why not? So <laughs> scene one and then we went off. And um, the editor, Anna Oestel, that was her first film as well because we couldn't get a, an established professional editor. So everybody was like a first-timer. And then um, I finished the film. 
and the first person to ever see the movie was uh, Peter Olbeck, uh, Jensen at that time, who had, was owning the production company that was doing the film with me, and my father. Because uh, at the same time as I was making push of my father was editing Breaking the Waves. And so Lars and I were doing you know, our, our own films across the hall. And so um, <laughs> um, they found it very funny. And uh, my, I think my father, who had been very, you cannot drop out of film school. You don't know how to make a movie because you have been taught how to make a movie. You have to do it the traditional way. This is how we all do it. Now, I grew up in New York, you know, with my mother and stepfather, and they were like, fuck it, you know, just go do it. So, of course, that was a great surprise that, the, um, that there was a lot of um, surprise for the film. And um, then it premiered, and it didn't get very good reviews, but it caught on to a young generation that hadn't really seen a Danish film like that, as Matt was saying. And that kind of changed a lot of things here in the industry. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you can add, obviously, that it was, it was a big city film, predominantly. I, I don't think that a lot of people saw it in, in what we call Jylland, which is the mainland, but, but uh, it was a Copenhagen film. Uh, and I think among the filmmakers, I can't speak for all of them, I think there was a surprise. You know, and one of the surprises was like, but, but, you can't. You know, uh, and which was cool for us, and we didn't think about it. We just did it the way we thought was right. But there was that feeling of like, but where's the dog, and where's the story where the girl starts? You know, it's, we were so hooked up. And even though there was changes in Danish ways of making films, there was still the structure of telling a story. That, I mean, the dog has to come home now. You know, <laughs> and and I think that was like even more provoking than the actual energy of the film. It was the storytelling of it that was like, that they hadn't seen. How can you end a film like that, you know? And then, um, of course, we all loved it. That's what we were going for. I watched a lot of films when I was a kid, not so much later on when I was actually dancing or, or, or going to school. But as a kid, it was a big part of my world. But, uh, but that was, among the stuff I was watching with Nicholas was some high quality things, which I never crossed uh, my path when I was a kid. Right? Uh, no, but they, so it's Nicholas, yeah, it's, it's a version of Nicholas. It's, it's definitely not him, but it's definitely a version of, uh, of his inner life in many ways. And I think, but you, I think that every character in his films is a version of, of Nicholas. This was maybe something that was quite obvious, but I would say that if you take the, the other characters, that would be a version of Nicholas as well, I guess. I, I, I totally true. I'm a complete narcissist. And uh, that was... Um, no, I mean, I knew... Uh, uh, Kipman, I knew uh, Slatko Buric. Uh, and then the other ones I did not. Liu uh, was uh, new for me, and Rekke Louise Andersen was new for me, and, and Levino was new for me. Yeah. Uh, but we did the... <laughs> Again, something very rock and rolly, childish. We just spend a lot of days together, uh, talking about the script and, and drinking and, and getting into fights, and then we knew each other. I, I remember that um, I, uh, I I I had you guys over, and I made That's you true. guys drink a lot of alcohol, and then I would film you afterwards. We have and to I'm mention that Nicholas never ever drinks. No, I, yes, I don't drink, but everyone else is, and I kind of I'm I'm. I, s I keep on hoping that I will find that tape somewhere. It is somewhere. Because it could be an incredible, an incredible um, it, it, uh, <laughs> let me see, document of, of a s certain time of innocence. I think that after Pusher, um, which, you know, was very surprising, I think, to all of us, the way it turned out and what it later on inspired and so forth in, in Danish cinema. But for me personally, um, you know, we weren't, I, I, I thought we were going to be like welcomed into the establishment now, you know, that the kingdom would open and 
and we would all we would all be invited into the establishment and so forth and that that didn't happen you know we didn't we didn't win any prizes we didn't the reviews were not particularly great a lot of people find it unrealistic mm -hmm. which i thought was kind of ironic especially when all the cocaine was real um but um so i i think that for me i was like well this is obviously not refined art this is this is a, a genre movie so what should i do now and and i i think that i not knowing was wanting to be much more um, introverted rather than becoming more sure extroverted and and certainly not wanting to repeat what i had just done so i had these ideas of these characters and a lot about watching films and what you know how do you grow up watching films and the death of film you know and and which is obviously now that film is completely dead <laughs> but um you know but i wanted to work with the same actors i think that after Pushu, we had built such a synergy around us, especially Mats and I, you know, um, had gravitated towards each other in a much more personal way. And um, so in a way, it naturally became him in the foreground, would suddenly step up. And um, it was a hard film to make. We, we didn't have, we couldn't get the money to make the film. So we literally started the film without having all the, the financing in place. And I closed the financing, I think, within the second day of the shoot. But it was a very, very difficult ride to um, to get it financed and uh, a lot of turbulent times. And uh, at that time, some of the other people in the troupe had had a lot of personal problems and they had gone insane. And, and so they were the only stable thing around me was Matt. So And Slatko. And Slatko. And us three kind of defined the film, you know. And um. it was our seventies, where a lot of things happened. Uh, and I think, that, but I think, a Bleeder was a very different story and a very different energy from from the Pusher film. I think that for any actor, it's a um, it's a blessing if you have two directors seeing you with different eyes. But to have one director to see you with different eyes is, is a, a twice a, a biggest blessing, right? It's not every day you, when a director would ask you to do that kind of thing and then some completely different two years later. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, and that's not only for my character, you could say that for, for a lot of the characters in the Bleeder film. Uh, so it felt as if we were not just going rock and roll anymore. We were not just, hey, this is us, let's do this. We were actually becoming actors, creating what we believed art, mm -hmm. yeah, and and doing something that was out of the box for ourselves. We're not just a rock and roll group. We were actually, I think it's quite mad. I don't think we have had anyone in Denmark doing that. And also, you can kind of say the love story because I remember my mother. She saw when she saw Drive. She said, "Oh, it's just like Bleeder," because the love story between you and Liv. Is very very similar to the loss between the driver and um, Irene, the mm. Carrie the Carrie Mulligan character. Uh, it's in a way very identical in many of the scenes and how they were made, and this whole thing about silence and just looking at each other, and this very kind of very overly poetic kind of sense of love as an ideal, like love without the complications. It's like you know teenage love, which is what drive is a lot about is protecting innocence of love and i i i that all came from bleeder in a way you know i i could see what my mother meant when she brought that up and then a lot of references to the films i grew up with and the films at the time that was defining what i was gravitating towards um and i was very open about everything around me but of course, I wanted to make a film about people watching films, so it naturally came up. I, I kind of gave up discussing too much about films because in the end, people just stopped listening, <laughs> and it got a little embarrassing. No, it's nothing embarrassing, my, you know, because yeah. I didn't really know what else to talk about. And uh, but that's the thing with Nicholas. He's, uh, he's, he's 
basically, you talk about film. I mean, films. That's it. And basically, I talk about sports. So the conversations are not that interesting when we're together, unless we talk about Buster Keaton and Bruce Lee. And that's yeah. about 10 minutes. Yeah. So then it's <laughs> then like that. a lot of silence yeah. afterwards. Yeah. But it's, I mean, that was kind of like the, the thing with, with was for me, make the film, I wanted to figure out how not to make what I was, I was interested in what a film is not. And so, because I, I knew that the, the, the way that we made Push It, the way that it was kind of uh, surrounded, the way that it was structured was that, you know, it was a fairly conventional story and it was very much inspired by, you know, a certain New York kind of filmmaking and a certain existentialistic structure of an open ending and so forth. So it was pretty much categorized like that. And then I was like, well, I'm not going to spend my whole life making that again. So how else can you make a film? And multiple times in a way, that's always been the uh, challenge is to figure out how not to make a film because I'm not really interested, especially not now, but I started getting less interested in films and more interested in what it could become. And so, you know, Bleeder in that way is very awkwardly structured and for good and bad, but in a way it's what makes it more interesting to me than Pusher because there was a certain sense of authenticity in it that wasn't in our first film. Not that it's any way better, it's just different. Um, but I'm, I'm... But did you start, did you, uh, were you consciously taking a choice with the camera that was in Pusha One, was a complete handheld, yeah. energetic, go with the guys wherever they go, which we also did some of the time in Bleed Up, but then all of a sudden there were like much more static shots, like the roles of film, the use of opera, mm. uh, walking feet and nothing else. So that was a quite conscious uh, choice you made mm -hmm. to mix those two ideas. Yeah. But it was more like when we made Pusher, I didn't know, I don't think any of us knew how to make a movie. So it was like we were just, we struck gold the first time. And then rather than repeating that, which would be an easy scenario, it was like, okay, let's wipe it all clean. Let's do something that we didn't do before, but keeping the same group of actors keeping the same crew behind the camera, you know, same DOP and composers and stuff like that. Maybe I was also, you know, hiding behind the safety net of that group as well, you know, and, and, uh, but at the same time, we were all in it together, you know, I was like, well, what we had here, let's take it over here, but I don't really know what's going to happen, but it'll be interesting to see. So it was more like, it was like a big experiment to see how would this turn out. And, you know, the film became what it was. But I think for, for us, it was more like, you know, we, were, we had a little bit of exposure to the international world through Pusher. And even though we don't have a lot in common, you know, uh, we wanted to get out both of us. We wanted to get out of the Danish borders. We wanted, we wanted to see what was the potentials around the world. And we were both very, very ambitious. And I think that's what connects us through Pusher going into Bleeder is that we were both very dedicated and very, very focused. I was certainly very unhealthy focused and obsessed with getting out of the country. But that's, all, I mean, you came from somewhere else as well. I mean, so you also experienced what mm -hmm. it, both sides of the thing. I mean, we were blessed in the first, uh, in the first place that, that we got the chance to do anything in Denmark at all. Uh, so I think you were more so than the rest of us, uh, like knowing what was there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, where I think maybe we were just like, um, we were grateful uh, that there was more to exploit mm -hmm. still in Denmark. This is still fun. This is maybe the most rock and roll place we can get. If we go to other places, they will sit on the film. We have, n we have nothing to say anymore. Everybody would take it from us. So that, it was like one of these things. Uh, 
but at the same time, you can't choose as an actor to go and say, well, now I will work somewhere else. <laughs> it's not really up to you. Right? No, but I think it was we were the ones who used the opportunities that these two films allowed. That's true. It was to to get out in a way, yeah. you know, and to to seek. And I was certainly probably not the m most healthiest, nicest person at that time in my life, you know. But you know, arrogance creates speed sometimes, and speed creates wants and needs and desires. And I just wanted to get away, and I wanted to obtain the greatest of the greatest, and I wanted to be a legend, and I wanted to be a mythology, and hopefully now, actually. I didn't want to make any money. That came later. Now I just wanted to be very, very famous. So I think that what's, we did these two films, and then we kind of went our separate ways for a long period, you know, and I went off and I, to Canada thinking I was now going to cross the ocean into greatness and be welcomed back to the kingdom of great cinema, and obviously that didn't happen. The exact opposite happened. I ended up in a bankruptcy in a failed film. When we after Bleeder, we kind of, I went this way, he went that way. We were quite a lot in touch when you did Fear X, actually. We, we talked a lot. Yeah, but that was just in the beginning. Okay. That was in the beginning. And we, the, the, what's ironic is that we kind of, we went our separate ways. Yes. And so for us, individually, at least for me, what brought me back to Denmark to pick up my career, but also brought me back with, with Matt's, in a way where all the experience that I felt we had had separately or together suddenly brought us into a system where we were able to make, to pick it up where we started. Because mm. we kind of picked it up Pretty much. from the beginning yeah. with Pusher 2. It was like, well, let's go back to how we used to do things and do it again. But we had become wiser, smarter, better, harder, but mo more just understanding what works and what doesn't work in a more kind of useful way, I think. I th and then I think we were still, uh, we were still throwing the, uh, the energy card out there, the rock and roll card. We didn't want it to be massive. We didn't want it to be too difficult in that sense. We wanted it to be movable. We need to move fast, get inspired, let's go. Mm. Uh, and and I, I think that there was also like a at least a touch in me that went like, but this is 10 years ago, do we still, can we still go for it with the same enthusiasm? Are we a little reluctant doing it? And do I want to play that idiot again? Uh, you know, I mean, honestly, he was just, <laughs> he was so young in his head. But something interesting happened was we, we went over the script for, for a week or two mm -hmm. and talked, and, and we found the key to make the character uh, the, uh, the supporting actor in his own film. And uh, when that was found, everything just, all the pieces fell into place. Got my hair shaved, got the tattoos on, and it just felt, yes, this is what we're doing. You didn't even age, you didn't even look older. But that's because you don't have any hair. When you don't have any hair, you don't see <laughs> the same way. Right? But that was what's so ironic. I mean, That was crazy. He didn't, it didn't look as if he aged, no. and in his mind, of course, he hadn't aged at all. Mm. He was just as dumb as ever. Uh, and But there was a certain fear if we can reproduce that energy. But... But something really nice happened once we, we found the key to the script there and everything just went, yes, let's go for it. Right? I think we've been used to starting out like that and I see it in my own life that I, I do other things that are much more uh, structured things or bigger things or you know, things with 80 producers. But there's also a core, always a core of you that wants to go back and do the, the smaller version of something a little more rock and roll feel because there is something magical happening there that you wouldn't, you can never put on a piece of paper. It happens there and you should be re ready to catch it, right? And I think that because we started out like that, it will always be part of uh, the way yeah. that we like to work, even though it's a little more tricky when you're 50 something than when you're 20 something. Mm -hmm. But it's always there, which is good. I think I'd written a better story in Pusher 2 than Pusher 1 and the whole family thing, you know, and using a lot of that in my own life, but also with Matt's own kind of, he had been a father a lot longer than I had, but suddenly there was a new chapter that we could connect and talk about when we were kind of working on the script. 
until we went and made it. And, you know, at that time I had been pretty depressed and humiliated and I felt my career was over. So it was like with Matt, I certainly felt for my own sake, I kind of reinvented what I had originally. And because I couldn't make the movie without Matt. So it was like, it was make, make or break, you know, and Matt, you know, thank God agreed. And I wonder what you actually went through your mind when I called you and said, hey, how, I think I actually called you because you were, you, were, you were away. So I called you in an airport and I said, what do you think about Pusha 2? And he's like, you were pretty quick to say yes. Yeah, I mean, I th to be honest, I think you also already mentioned the fact that uh, you're doing it for the money because you're bankrupt. <laughs> and uh, it's like, that sounds need, like a I really money. that sounds like a really good start. Yeah. Uh, and push it to second one. But you he's always talked you always talked about like let's follow the other characters. Let's see what this mm. guy is doing and this girl is doing, right? Mm. And so that would be the first one out of 100 and but it just took us 10 years to get there. Mm. I, I didn't mind the idea at all. I think that the, the pitch of the whole story was what it was. It was much more about diving into the character again and from there on find the story even in, in, in better details. I mean, yes, there was a family theme in the film, but not really, not in his world. And we had to realize that, that for him, it, that wasn't a big thing. Uh, but but for us it was so so it had to be something that the viewer saw that he never saw, and and to f that was a really nice thing to, to find a, the key to a character. But it, it yes, I did say yes really fast because uh, because basically this is going to sound terrible, but I I do love working with you, and and I think that the things we've done has been has always been something. There's always been some kind of the feeling of something radical in there which I love. I love that word, radical. I think it's the most important word in, in movie making. No doubt. But uh, yeah, we do some crazy things in that film, uh, in Pusha 2. But also, uh, you had a lot of... Uh, um, uh, <laughs> everyone besides Mets were people from... Were, I guess were real gangsters. Yeah. Prostitutes. And, and prostitutes and whatever. Porn stars. We could... Uh, and yes, we had porn stars as well. And um, one of the guys could not remember his lines, so Matt always had to <laughs> cue his lines. Remember, yeah. that was hard for you. It was difficult because we didn't, we never shoot like this. Now it's your turn. You know, it's the classical way is to like, this is your shot, and then we got you, and we take the camera and do that. Modern is always working with something's happening here, and he might just, without you knowing, it, go here. It's like a fly on the wall. So we had to obviously, I had to feed him his lines, and sometimes feed him his energy. And then when I saw Morden <laughs> kind of moving towards me, c go back to my character. <laughs> so, so it was like, it was kind of bizarre. There was a quite a few times where he caught me standing, <laughs> feeding lines and stuff. But it was pretty funny. I yeah, mean, it was crazy. I mean, yeah. and I, I have to admire, that is, that is not just playing yourself, but no. having to tell everyone else their lines before the camera moves over. Because we, we always did very long takes that just went on and on and on and on and on. So we couldn't stop and say, no, no, you have to say that line. It was like... You but know, uh, and I, th I remember the first, uh, the first introduction to that was the opening scene where you're sitting in prison with. Uh, oh yeah, with, uh, with Dan Dummer. Dan Dummer. <laughs> and then you know uh, we were shot in a real prison, and uh, and and uh, apparently this this guy who who has a sh what shady past or he has a CV. Yeah, <laughs> he has a CV, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the story that he tells in the film is actually his own life. That's from mm. his own. He he told me that story, so I asked, "Can you just not tell that story?" And he said, "Sure." He just wanted to change a few things so it didn't hurt specific people, but uh, in terms of names. <laughs> but he thought that you would basically, you know, the camera would be on me. I would say one line, and then we would cut, and then move the camera well, over right, to yeah. him and say, "Cut." Then when he came on the day to do the scene, I said, no, 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 you, you have to know the whole thing all the way through. <laughs> I could see his, like, his tension and his like, stress factor <laughs> went very high up. Yeah. And I was like, Matt, you deal with that. I'm sure you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll do it. Yeah, you'll do it fine. Just, just, but that's just a, sit with him. That's a, an ability Nicholas has. There's a certain things that he finds uncomfortable. <laughs> he will always uh, bail out and tell me, can you just tell her to say that word? 
<laughs> and he can't even say the word loud because it's a dirty <laughs> word. And then it just disappears. And then, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, we, no, we but had that worked really fun. I mean, most of the time, a lot of this stuff, improvisation, and these guys are so good at that as well. So that's not the issue. But mm. some of the lines that we needed to, to you know, move on with the story is if they'd never showed up in, in the scene, we had obviously to go back and, 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 and redo it. And, and there was more of that here than there was in the first push. Oh, yeah, there was a lot more. I mean, that's why Pusher 2 is a lot better movie, mm. you know. I, uh, I have to confess, I was invited to Matt's birthday last year, was it, when he turned 50? Yeah, that was last year. And um, everyone was giving speeches because all the directors you had worked with were there. Not all. Well, okay, the ones you liked. Yeah. And uh, I think I was the last one to be invited, <coughs> you know, which is okay, no, don't worry not. about it. Who said that? Who told you that? I knew that because it was Henne who said oh, it to like, me in France. Like me, 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 dot com, there you yeah. go again. So, uh, but um, I remember that after everyone had given their speeches, praising, you know, how great you are and the most amazing and unique and you actually, which is true. I mean, and, and you're a movie star, which we all know, and you have done things that no one out of Denmark has done ever. And, and you have made not just great films, but iconic films and you're in every franchise now. So, you know, <laughs> what can you say? So I, I stood up and I, I said I didn't really have anything to add to this other than that, you know, he'd always been the only man in my life. Which he was because you became my first kind of male alter ego in a way. It came out a little wrong when you said it, but you did correct it <laughs> in the speech. I would say that speech was yeah. the best speech of the evening. By far. By far. It, it, uh, but I really meant it by saying that we, when we started making films with Pusher and Pleader, there was a sense of like, you, you as a drug, you always try to search for somebody that represents you in a certain way. And I was very fortunate to find that in, in Mads Mikkelsen, you know, and... Well, this is very romantic. <laughs> no, but it is. I mean, if you think about it, that was like, you know, um, uh, you know, when the film came out in Denmark, it was, you know, it was actually, it was very successful compared to what kind of film it is in terms of, you know, it's fairly depressing, I believe. Well, it's also very non-depressing. It's quite funny also, but, you know, and it, but it was like, I remember we went to the Venice Film Festival. Yeah. You know, it was our first time being invited to like an international film festival. That was a big thing. Um, unfortunately, what happened was, and uh, it premiered in Olos and then it premiered in the UK. And then uh, we got all the way to the US where we, we had a very limited run at Lincoln Film Center Society. And then the company that was selling the movie went bankrupt and the film disappeared from the market, which was, you know, really depressing and sad. And by that time I was moving on to other things and so forth. So it took me many, many years. I didn't get to buy this movie until a couple of years ago. I actually bought it out of the old bankruptcy and I now own it again. You should have told me I got a copy. <laughs> Put it online for free. Okay. But I, you know, I. We actually went. We went to Cannes. To be frank, we went to Cannes. We, we didn't. To Cannes. We, we were not invited. No, Cannes. we were not invited at Cannes. We went there, and I don't know why. For some reason, somebody had told me that it was pretty cold in Cannes, so I only had some like really winter boots and some big socks and stuff with me. You always wearing just short pants. I was. I'm. I yeah. was prepared. But it was one of these things where you you, you felt like. You're standing on the street, you're going, do you want to serve with you? You know, nobody knew who we were, nobody were interested in oh, the film. God. And we got the brutality of you watching it with the buyers, which is like five minutes, five minutes in, half of people leave. They either buy it or not. We didn't know that. We just thought they, they left because they didn't like it, which might have been the case. But it was one of these things where we felt like, you know what? We're so proud of this film. So fuck them. We'll be back. We'll show. You know, uh, if it's not this time, we'll do it later. Yeah. And, and and that was the first time. And then uh, I never went to Cannes. And then years after, uh, Nicholas won, and I was, uh, <laughs> and he was nominated again. And I was in the jury, which was of course 
complete absurd in such a short range of years that we have became, become kind of the establishment without feeling we were. After push two, you know, um, we went our separate ways again. And then it wasn't until I called you to say... I'm bankrupt. <laughs> no. another one. <laughs> I said, I'm in Scotland, and let's... What about this Viking film? That's true. And you were like, all my life I've been wishing to play Viking. Yeah. Then you added that you hated Vikings. Then I hated Vikings. You weren't going to have any dialogue, and you were going yeah. to have one eye. Yeah, and no future. And no future, and no past, and you were an alien. Yeah. And I thought about that. I said, yeah, what can go wrong there? <laughs> Let's do it. But in a way, that, that's what kind of like, um, like in terms of how we evolved, because that was our four films together, starting from Pusher and then ending with Silence mm -hmm. in the Scottish Oh, Bible, yeah, there from, was, from that many words to absolutely no yeah, words. There was a very that. beautiful kind of, uh, finale. Are we done? Or, no, 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 <laughs> we're not done. No. <laughs> but in terms of like a pause, like okay, because by, by then you yeah. had become like a big movie, international movie star, and, and, and I, you know, I was not there yet, you know, in terms of couldn't even match your, what they were paying you. So I went a different direction that changed my situation. And then we kind of, I guess, at least for me, I kind of, I stayed, you know, seeing what you were going through, and 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 in a way, we had kind of we had made it. Yeah, yeah. We had we yeah, had yeah. left our countries. We were. But it was very different stepping stones. That's what we saw. Yeah. It was a push it bleeder. Push it two was very different in, in in the adult way to approach a film. In many ways, in many ways, our best film. But uh, but uh, and then we did Hala, <laughs> which was a completely new step into a. Mm -hmm. Myth uh, mythology world, uh, uh, not only uh, by the nature of the storytelling, but also the nature of, of how to film it and how to go back to scratch and fall in love with the old Russian guys again and say, you know, the camera can tell the story. We don't have to babble all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are crazy steps to do for one director. I think, I mean, it's, it's not really up to us. We can only wait and see what the director wants, but for, for one director to do for so very, very different films in one country and then go somewhere else and do something completely different again. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, admirable and, and, and crazy to watch. But also the idea that we were very much in sync by then. I mean, we really knew each other very, very well. And, you know, we didn't, there was not a lot of talking. You know, there was not a lot of motivation discussions. There weren't. I didn't have to. I didn't have to manipulate in terms of. You know, I just come off. You know, I just completed Bronson, which was a very. You know. <laughs> yeah, that you did Bronson. You, before, I right? was a very like you know kindergarten yeah. teacher at some point, and then you know with Pusher there was you know and Peter's all the Kim Botnia mm. insanity, but Mats and I was always like. There was a kind of quick understanding, and then it just kind of evo it just just happened, and then that was that. It was always fun. Uh, a lot of the jobs I've, I've, I get, uh, where people where I get a phone call if they ask me, are based on on on, uh, on the Pusher trilogy. Uh, that, that they have seen that, and Valhalla Rising for that matter, Bleeder. They've seen that that time of Danish films. Also other films, of course, Susanne B. and Thomas Vindeberg's films and some of the crazy Anna's Thomas Jensen films, but, but very much to push a trilogy. It, has, uh, it seems as if everybody has it on their bookshelf there, back home, which is something that we should be very proud of. You know, what was great was, um, you know, when you did when you got to do James Bond, mm -hmm. it was like one of the guys from our little troop in the beginning. You know, yeah. we were a troop in a way. Yes, okay. You know, with me and, and Kim and Matt and Slacko, we were like really seeking each other out for those two films. And then suddenly, you know, we hear this rumor and then it's obviously true that 
Matt is going to be the next villain in one of the actually best James Bond movies. It's a, it's a and yeah. um, I was in London. Um, that's true. In the premiere? At the premiere? Yeah. And that's why Pusher 2 was after Bond. What's that? You sure about that? I think that was... Uh, that no, 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 That's it was Well Horizon. Mm -hmm. We're two, like, two old men. But I remember I was in London. I was directing Miss Marble That's right. for British for ITV. I was pretty depressed and felt like, again, my career was completely over here. I was in England living in Kilburn. And Matt was over there. Uh, you were over there because you were doing ADR. So you were coming to London a lot for Bond. And you invited me to premiere, mm -hmm. and uh, and you also was there with my two car crashes. Remember? That's true. I had this assistant. She lasted for a week, but we ended up in two car crashes in the same week. And Matt was the but only she guy was a I knew better driver than Nicholas. <laughs> she could drive, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I I remember that you were actually there. When yeah, those things true. happened to me, you were quite shocked. That was, that was terrifying, and it's and um, so that was you know in a, in, a, in a and again we kind of found ourselves at the verges of something happening, and this time we were in London, and and so Matt said, hey, you want to come to the premiere, but you got to get a suit, and I didn't. I was like, all the money I was making on Ms. Marble, I was saving to pay back the bank, <laughs> and. Um, so I had I spent you know 15 pounds on a suit in Trimark or something, mm -hmm. and I've got a big. You managed to be wearing suit that was the most ugliest thing you can ever imagine. But up the red carpet, he did you manage to wear his gigantic red. Uh, Teletubby. You know, Teletubby coats like yeah. Canadian goose and thing. And a big helmet and things like, like that. You couldn't see he was wearing a suit. Because I was sick. I was actually sick, and they. I remember now I was sat next to Paris Hilton and Sting. And here I was in my big, huge red Parker. <laughs> Teletubby of a costume, and and you came on, and I, and you had to say hello to the Queen. I remember. Yeah. And we went to the after party. As I say, she said hello to me. She said hello to you, and we went to the after party. That was like. Yeah, it was fun to have uh, gone that. Um, all of a sudden, be there. Leicester Square. It was 000. pretty cool. I was kind of concerned that you wouldn't want to do uh, Valhalla Rising after. It. Yeah. I was a little because like this, you know, when you, I mean, when you make something like that, would you want to yeah. go back and make almost no money yeah. and eat bad Scottish food in the Highlands? Yeah. But you know, again, when I reached out, you know, Matt said, "Sure." So yeah. there is a bond between us. We can't ever 